Good morning, madam. Good morning, sir. Good morning. A very good morning, good morning, morning to you. I am Shulini Gowda, principal of CK Pukhsami Vishet College. I am happy to invite you for this occasion. Very happy occasion. And uh, you are a learned person. You are going to educate us and enlighten us on various issues on cultural changes, environmental changes. And I hope that you are going to cover all important issues. And uh, definitely, we recognize your services. In fact, uh, we wanted you physically in Mysore, but in near future, if you arrange any seminars and conferences, definitely we are, we are going to invite you. At that time, you please uh, make yourself convenient to come come over to Mysore, madam. So we are happy to have with us you today. So today, you are going to speak on. Uh, the 2020 the age of realization lessons to be learned that is a very critical uh, evaluation so let us see how we are going to demonstrate and educate our uh, scholars and professors and uh, uh, students about the future consequences so with this i hope i welcome you madam so professor uh, lata manish he will going to welcome you Thank you. Yeah. Good morning, madam. A very good morning to you, ma'am. Yeah. yeah. Good morning to each and everyone who have virtually gathered for this uh, webinar, 2020, the age of realization. Will lessons be learned? There is a big question mark, and we have to answer for that. Anyway, uh, before introducing today's resource person, Madam Ranjita Menon, I like to give a bit information about the achievements achieved and programs run by CSC because resource person is strongly associated with CSC in different programs. Center for Science and uh, Environment is a public interest research and advocacy organization based in New Delhi. CSC research into lobbies and uh, communica communicates the urgency of development that is both sustainable and equitable. CSC is widely acknowledged for its intellectual leadership and the institution has grown into one of India's most influential and highly local environmental NGOs. Some prominent domestic and international awards include the 2005 Stockholm Water Prize and the Prince Albert II of Monaco Foundation Water Award in 2008. Sunita Narain, the present CSE Director General, received the prestigious Padma Shri from the Government of India in 2006. Recently, CSE was named the recipient of prestigious Indira Gandhi Prize for Peace, Disarmament and Development for the year 2018 for its pioneering work on environment and sustainable development. Some of the notable environmental programs run by CSC includes Right to Clean Air campaign that has achieved remarkable success in pushing for CNG in all public transport in Delhi and more recently in pushing for better urban mobility options that have made significant impact on the city's air quality. And one more campaign, People's Water Management Campaign that mobilized the country through a water literacy campaign calling for decentralized solutions to water harvesting, water pollution, urban sewage management, catalyzing policy changes at both national and state levels in recognition for its efforts, CSC was awarded the Stockholm Water Prize in 2005, the highest international award for water management. CSC has created anti-toxins campaign for far-reaching changes in the policies and regulations governing the use of toxins such as pesticides and heavy metals. The two high-profile studies that found high levels of pesticide residues in bottled water and soft drinks serve to highlight public health concerns and are important contributions in managing the toxic fallouts of rapid economic and industrial growth. Uh, one more program, Global Environmental Governance Program, where CSC actively participates in influencing international negotiations on climate change by stressing the need for equity and equal access to the atmospheric commons. With this information related to CSC, I'm very glad to introduce the person who is also part of CSC, Madam Ranjita Menon. Madam has more than 20 years of experience working in the corporate sector, and Madam has decided to pursue a career in the social sector, starting with Delhi in the CSR division. 
From Dell, she moved to CSE to update their environment initiatives for youths. Ranjita Menon, Madam, at CSE's Environment Education Unit, as the Program Director for uh, Environmental Education Unit, Madam is responsible for the strategic direction of the unit that serves to educate and sensitize school and college students on environmental challenges. CSE realized that while nature education is important, students must also understand how human beings, human societies interact with the environment for their growth and survival. How human beings must coexist with the environment for a sustainable and equitable future. Meaningful environmental education is key and the environmental education unit works with a specific section of the population through its two successful programs, Green School Program and University Program. With this bit of information, I'm very glad to welcome you, madam, and uh, you can continue with the session. Thank you, madam. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much. I hope I can hear all of you. Uh, thank you for the very uh, warm welcome to you, ma'am. Very warm welcome note from you, ma'am, and also, sir. Uh, it indeed is a great pleasure to be speaking to Sri uh, Sri K. Puttaswami First Grade College. And uh, just to all the, uh, you know, all the participants who have logged in, I must tell you that we have a very long association with uh, Dr. Latamani. I think it goes a very long way. Um, uh, Pam is a member of the SE Green Educators Network. A network, uh, I think there is an echo. Can everyone hear me clearly? Yes, is that okay? All right. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say that uh, uh, you know, CSE launched its Green Educator Network as part of this university program way back in 2016. The network is to uh, solely, exclusively for faculty uh, teaching papers related to environment. Lata Mani has been associated with her field of environment much before, but she's been part of the network uh, since then, and we've had very, very interesting dialogues, and over the years, the bond has grown stronger. So it indeed gives me a great pleasure uh, to be here, uh, to speak to the students, faculty, faculty members, and others of Sri uh, K. Swami First Grade College. Uh, so thank you so much. And with that, let me try sharing the presentation. It's been a very bad day in uh, Delhi today, uh, which I think most of India too. Uh, monsoons kind of arrived late, um, but uh, for all of yesterday and today, there has been uh, uh, you know continuous and steady rainfall. So I am just trying to move. Uh, yes. So uh, I hope you can see my presentation. I cannot see the screen. So uh, and as luck would have it, because of the continuous rain uh, since yesterday, uh, the internet service is rather weak in office, and I could not print my notes. So uh, let me make sense of what I have written by going through the presentation. Um, I thought uh, you know with COVID again, continuing to rage across the country and still on a rampage. And, um, yeah, you know, it has, um, it's now gone on to uh, rural areas and, um, you know, it's spreading across other parts of India. Uh, I wanted to check, it's now five or six months. Um, you know, I think March 20th or 22nd was when uh, we went, when we went into a national lockdown. So that makes it around six months. Uh, it's kind of dawned on us during these six months period, we will actually experience clear skies and, um, you know, you see a lot of photographs uh, on various groups saying that we can now see this border, you know, the mountain ranges, uh, you know, animals that were hitherto unseen are now coming on the roads. Some of it could be fiction, some of it could be true, but uh, has it dawned on us? Have we realized that climate change we still haven't realized that it's climate change impact of climate change that's, that is affecting us. But there is some realization. With this realization, have there been any lessons that we have learned? It's too early to talk about all the lessons that we have learned. But um, or in fact, even a few. But yes, uh, I will touch on air pollution and health 
towards the end of uh, uh, you know towards the end of my presentation where actually we have seen the remarkable difference but are there any learnings from there or not is a big question mark even i cannot answer because ultimately it rests on you me policy makers the government etc so as the year unfolds we still we are, we are in now in august uh, mid august we have another few months to go and you know at the end of the year we can look back and or maybe even early next year have we learned something or not has covid 19 taught us something or not is a big question that will be answered or i hope it it will be answered as we learn more uh going on to my next slide like i said uh this year has been the year of the disruptor right uh covid 19 the corona virus has completely distracted us in fact uh of course for every good reason we need to find out more about covid 19 how do we restrain it uh but but that has taken our attention away from from even the bigger picture which is climate change right um we call it by different names it could be climate emergency climate crisis but whatever right the ex- the weather events the extreme weather events that are happening around it is all the result but have we connected the no- have we connected the dots so yes covid 19 has distracted us but i would like to bring all your attention to the bigger issue which is climate change uh covid is uh, covid 19 has struck us the people who are at risk are people with comorbidities how did that come about because of bad air bad food access to uh, water and sanitation is clean water and sanitation is limited so because of that there have been health issues that comes uh, that you know that uh, and people with these health issues have been affected more now health needs to come first right we need to do much much more to prevent diseases and yeah. uh so to bring back when i talk about air quality right it has been happening it's not because of covid 19 that it has come to the forefront a uh, csc has always uh, ma'am latamani already talked about our work that we have done in the space of clean air uh but uh, you know it's in delhi that people are realizing now uh, there has been mass movement there has been public movement bringing the issue to uh, parliamentarians uh, you know it has come on to the streets but even then it's still not mainstream right air pollution is the biggest uh, is the fifth largest killer in india right but still do people realize it is a big question right it is normally seen that um, you know uh, that the epicenter of uh, uh, you know air toxic air or air pollution is delhi but over the past few years there has been a depression there has been a dip right and uh, we have delhi has managed to um, i wouldn't say control but yes we have made great strides in uh, um, in, in you know in stopping the worsening of uh, uh, toxic air but of course a lot needs to be done right before we actually arrive at the standards at um, you know good standards prescribed by various uh, bodies uh when delhi is when delhi is affected by uh, bad air pollution of course it goes through the year but uh, it's in october november it really hits the people and then there is a lot of talk about it but when it hits delhi it is not just delhi that is impacted even the neighboring areas right it like i said it covers entire big cities small cities villages rural villages, villages across in the north india the entire indo gangetic plain is affected right by air pollution but for some reason it's delhi that's more was talked about um of course the worsening air pollution is uh, you know there are a host of factors that contribute uh, to it yeah it could be the winds uh, like i said the episodic pollution which is could be due to crackers bursting of fire crackers uh, during diwali or it could be a uh, stubble burning across the borders um you know there are um, uh, tail pipe emissions industrial emissions etc there are several factors that contribute but it is not uh, you know but as all of us know we all share a common air shed right air pollution does not respect borders it comes into delhi it goes out of delhi and all the action that we take cannot be solved by just taking measures in delhi 
right? I just want to touch on the sources of pollution. All of us know it, but I would still uh, like to say it's vehicular emission. It's one of the biggest sources of pollution. The others are industrial pollution. And, um, you know, I would, um, I would also like, I should have taken this point about, um, you know, the NOx and uh, PM2 uh, point uh, um, emissions are mainly through uh, vehicles. And transportation contributes around 20% right uh, uh you know to air pollution to climate change so this is just in a nutshell what the various sources are uh because i'm talking to a wide diverse kind of audience i need to we want to increase your awareness too we need you to know i mean maybe you know sitting in south of india uh you know you may not uh, uh you know toxic uh, air is not, may not really be an issue, though of course we've learned that Chennai too has been affected, which means other, uh, you know, other cities or towns or villages near Chennai will also be affected. Uh, who monitors, right? So please, for your information, I've just put this slide for you to know, yes, we do have uh, uh, bodies uh, who uh, monitor air quality in India. Uh, you have at uh, you know at the apex uh, the central pollution control board and every state has their own SPCBs, right? Uh, what are the pollutants that are regulated? I have put the uh, you know I have put um, various like SOX or NOx and uh, particulate matter such as PM10, 2.5. Uh, but measured are uh, SOX, NOx, and PM10. Uh, and you know we are still. In the process of putting, we in the sense of country is still in the process of putting air pollution uh, monitors and select cities to monitor other pollutants. Yeah, uh, I think every citizen in India needs to know about the air quality index, right? Uh, if air, you know, if air pollution is the fifth largest uh, uh, killer in India. Then we need to know the status of air pollution. So I put up the slide again. Uh, in places like Delhi, uh, you know, our daily newspapers do do you know put out this box. I don't know if you can see the box here. Uh, the range, uh, you know, it comes out, and the papers start covering it every day, uh, either online or offline. We do come to know that what is the status of uh, Delhi's uh, air on that particular day and right now it is satisfactory um we haven't uh, moderately polluted uh you know the rains do push away the um, uh you know bad air uh but all of you need to know right how do we monitor why are we monitoring air right i've given the reasons here because if you monitor then you know what the problem must problem is you come to know about the gravity the extent of the problem, you're aware, you make people aware about, you know, about the air pollution. Uh, you, know, you make them aware, you alert them. And of course, at the policy level, we can take action and also measure if those policies have made, have, have had a positive outcome or not. And whether over the long term, we had an impact. Like I said, uh, it would be great if you know the, uh, you know, categories, uh, you know, air quality is measured as uh, severe, very poor, poor, moderately uh, polluted, satisfactory, and good. Right? These are the six categories that we have. That we have. They're color-coded. It's good for everyone to know, huh? especially, the, especially because India, or at least Delhi and many other uh, cities in uh, in the Indo-Gazantic plain have the dubious distinction of being one of the uh, worst polluted cities. Yeah. So um, I don't know how many of you are aware in the recent address, uh, the, uh, you know, our prime minister had said we're going into mission mode uh, for clean air in hundred cities. It's very good, but also to draw your attention, this national clean air program was announced in 2019. Right, and uh, but um, uh, you know, CPCD has been doing a lot of work, but uh, it seems to be impossible, um, you know, to achieve the target set. So, there have been 122 cities, 122 cities that have been identified, and their target is 2017 has been taken as a baseline year. From there, we need to reduce PM 2.5 and PM 10 by 20 to 30% by 2024. We have four years 
right? But uh, to achieve these targets, but uh, you know, where are we at? So, uh, uh, you know, and just to tell you, I'll tell you, that, you know, in a way, this COVID-19 has uh, shown us that clean air is possible. Yeah. Uh, but I will come to come on that later. Yeah. Um, as we move towards the conclusion, I want to say that uh, air pollution like COVID does not recognize who is rich or poor. They do not have any boundaries. Right. Everyone is affected. Um the you know the rich can look at short term measures right by buying air purifiers and all but that does not solve the problem right they have to get out it affects it impacts everyone like i said earlier right uh, airshed has no boundaries yeah and um, you know the poor yes because they may not have access to clean fuel they will be using the biomass and all they do not have access to clean energy they will also add to toxins but for no fault of theirs it is the rich with our suvs with your suvs that we add and we compound the uh you know the poor the air pollution that we have like i said earlier we are responding to air pollution a uh, lot has been done but we need to move with scale speed and with a difference in strategy yeah so that's what i've covered and air pollution i'm also conscious of the time uh, and i know we have i said uh, it's taking around uh, i thought i'll have 20 minutes uh, but i've already covered uh, 15 minutes and i'll but i'll take another 10 15 minutes for uh like I'm an email, and then we can proceed uh to q and a's yeah. state of water uh, uh, uh again here i've taken two or three key issues for you to understand because you know environment covers Diverse topics, right? But uh, everything cannot be covered in uh, you know twenty to thirty minutes. So I've taken key areas. I thought I'll talk about state of water, right? Our rivers are drying. You know that uh, you know the water that we drink is uh, you know has to be uh, has to go through several processes so that you know to make it drinkable. Uh, we uh, you know uh, if in a one point three billion population, sixty six hundred million. Do not have, uh, uh, you know, we are water stressed. Two lakh people do not have access to uh, clean water. They die. Uh, I put all these numbers. We are already we are just ten years away, where the demand for water is going to double. Um, all of you will be aware that groundwater, which is a shared heritage, uh, is depleting, and in fact, India is one of the largest consumers of uh, groundwater, and. And to add to this problem, there are more droughts and floods. So as we said earlier, water literacy is absolutely important uh, so that we can take control and improve the state of water. This is a pictorial depiction of just uh, what I talked about. Today, not even a single city has 24-7 water supply. Right, there are many challenges. I have put those uh, down. 70% of India's water is contaminated. Right, and 21 cities will run out of groundwater by end of this year. Yeah, and um, uh, you know all these numbers uh, just adds and shows how bad the situation is. It's a very familiar scene. I faced it this morning as I was coming into work. It could be infrastructure problems, and as all of us know, monsoon is not keep keeping to its timeline. Till around five years or even ten years ago, you may also look back. Uh, you will realize that uh, we could predict when monsoons will come. Uh, at least when I was going to school many, many years ago, decades ago, we knew that when schools opened by July, by July first week, monsoons would arrive. Similarly, Kerala, where I am from, um, you know, by June, when schools would reopen, monsoons, we could predict. But now it's not. It's receding further and further away from the timelines that are set. Uh, we didn't have rains in Delhi. I'm based in Delhi. Uh, we didn't have rains in July, but it was in, it was intermittent, uh, you know. But um, maybe you know there is a rainfall deficit. Uh, but over the last two days, we imagine we're in the midst of all this. Uh, it's been raining continually, right? As a result, this is the um, you know this is the uh, uh, this is the situation that we are facing. On one hand. Uh, you know, we are dependent on water tankers. On the other hand, right, uh, there is too much water. 
Yeah, but is that water of any use? It does not even percolate down into the uh, aquifers because of our tarred roads and uh, you know there are other issues right flooding is happening this scene could be anywhere in india people are there from maharashtra or from uh, uh, you know i just picked up bhubaneswar it's an old slide it could be any part of india we could be facing this uh, situation again just to touch on groundwater depletion uh, like I said, India is the one of the largest consumer. China and US are also there, but put together, India is still ahead, right? Uh, this map, unfortunately, I don't think you can see, but um, you know, if you, you see how much of stress is going to be there as the tube wells have come. I mean, we thought uh, many years ago when tube wells were introduced, we thought it could uh, solve the water crisis, but now we are just digging deeper and deeper. Right? And there are many other issues that come with it. There is contamination in water, uh, you know, in drinking water, thanks to the depth that we have gone under. Yeah. So that's the state of water, right? We have to bring water into the city. Earlier we were water sufficient. We are, now we are no more. Yeah. As we waste water, we are bringing water in, right? Uh, and as we flush, we are sending that water away too. So the water sanitation is uh, another area that is seriously uh, have a big, uh, uh, you know, have a big impact. Uh, uh, you know, uh, as we flush and we forget contaminating water bodies, which are also dry. So the situation is just getting worse and worse. Yeah. So coming back to my original, I said this year has been a disruptor, right? We are distracted. We have forgotten about the issue of climate change which is actually much, much bigger threat. COVID-19, I'm not undermining the issue of COVID-19, but we should not lose focus on climate change either. Climate change, you know, all the impact, we have felt it, right? Sitting in different parts of the country, we have felt the impact of climate change. It is happening around us right now, yeah? Each year becomes hotter than the previous year. Each year we break weather records. We try to act. But that action is too little, too late. Yeah. Yeah. Like I said, uh, what are the impacts? We are talking about events like bushfires happening in Australia, lotus attacks, right? It earlier used to be in the borders of Rajasthan. Now it has come down to uh, very close to where I stay, on the borders of Delhi. Yeah. It is coming further and further away. The intensity of whether it is hurricanes or cyclones, the intensity is happening, the frequency is more, right? We had, you know, um, uh, heat, uh, uh, you know, extreme heat uh, also that is happening, uh, you know, last year in Earth, Delhi was intense. Why? Because of mismanagement of resources, right? We cannot blame anyone but ourselves. It is making the world more insecure, not just India, whether it is Los Angeles or whether it's Australia, whether it's India, all of us are being impacted. It's, the world is insecure. Yeah. What is the impact? This, you know, this cycle of drought, flood, you know, crop loss, cyclones, these are happening over time, over months. Yeah, the impact, you know, it may come in a day or two, but the impact lasts. It impacts people. It destroys livelihood. The poor especially are most vulnerable, right? They are the victims of climate change. We may rebound, but not the poor. And worse, whatever, you know, whatever, uh, whatever gains, right, that we have made with development, that is wiped away right? Survival becomes more difficult. The people are migrating from place to place that it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, the migration due to uh, extreme weather events is much more. Of course, we have seen in recent COVID, uh, you know, the, during the recent months we have seen due to COVID, there has been other migration, which is really, really, uh, you know, which is really, uh, which has been heart rending. Yeah, so uh, you know, this is a slide that I've taken from uh, Sunita Narayan, our Director General. Uh, <laughs> you know, because of globalization, manufacturing is happening in other parts of the world, China, India, Bangladesh. 
right? But the hunger, the dream for consumption has been reduced, right? This has come at the cost of environment and labor, right? Uh, but we want it. We all want, we, we, you know, we have undermined the impact and environment uh, at the cost of our greed. Yeah, We want growth to continue at the cost of environment. So it's not just, again, I reiterate, I reinforce, I reinforce the climate change is more through human activities or anthropogenic activities that they say. It's because in the last 10 years or so, last 20 years, it's human activities that has increased the impact, right? That has led to more emissions, you know, leading to global warming and finally climate change. So, you know, we cannot, when, you know, when leaders say, when anyone says that it's climate change that has brought in, we must ask who is responsible for climate change? Who is responsible for extreme weather events? It's us. Yeah. And uh, what are the failures? Yeah. Uh, again, uh, three failures is how uh, we have identified is imagination. We keep doing the same thing, right? Can we do things differently? Can we look at uh, any tech, you know, technology, any other in a way that we can curb, you know, that we can curb emissions, right? So, uh, you know, what about imagination? Imagination has no borders. Yeah, we don't know how to do it. We forget to ask why. So there is the wisdom, the knowledge that, you know, we are not harnessing it. Yeah. And of course, compliance, enforcement and compliance is very weak. Right. We, uh, you know, uh, the regulations, we have, you have good regulations, but if we do not uh, enforce them. If it is enforced, we do not comply with them. So you see, in a way, it's all of us are responsible for current uh, situation. Yeah. Uh, like I said earlier, Action is still weak. Environmental issues, we know about it. Uh, we want easy answers. But there are no easy answers to the issues that we have created. Right? Technology could be there. But can we use, uh, you know, um, can we use, can we do it differently? Uh, looking at the development methods, are our development, is our development sustainable? Is the, is the question again. Yeah, so I'm coming to, uh, you know, we wanted to talk about lessons, right? So now I'm coming, uh, you know, what happened during COVID? Uh, CDC had monitored, we looked at the analysis from CPCB, and you can see when the lockdown was, uh, you know, was announced, right? We're looking at April, but from March end, this is a typical April day. These are the cities that we monitored, and you can see, right? There has been a dip compared to April 19 to April 20, uh, to April 2020, right? Talking about Delhi, right? There has been, look at the red, la red line, Delhi, uh, the red is uh, from March 30th to April 3rd. Huh? And look at from March 16 to 21 prior the lockdown, both in uh, Gurgaon or Gurugram as it's now called and Delhi. There certainly has, here there has been kind of, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, the pollution has flattened, right? So we looked at various sources of pollution too. And this is our conclusion. What really made the difference pre-lockdown and, you know, post I mean, you know, during lockdown, uh, or, you know, look at the impact on clean air. There certainly has been improvement. Right, and we looked at the sources of air pollution. It was, like I said, vehicles, industry, construction. The moment that was stopped, Delhi's air improved. Right. So take a look at these figures. It's really interesting. Like, uh, you know, whom do we lay the fault at? Right. All these are results of, uh, you know, human activities. Right. And this is where we need to take control. So that's the kind of lesson learned, right? During this, uh, during this very short period, we need to see if we can sustain it, right? Uh, so that's a big question. Yeah, like I said, uh, these are the lessons that we learned. Vehicles and combustion from industry are the reasons. When that stopped, air quality improved. Movement on the road was not there. 
all of us stayed at home. That really had a huge uh, impact. But is that the answer? Do we need COVID? Okay. This is, uh, you know, something that I've taken, right? In the, all of, you know, the world said, right? Huh? Uh, there is less air pollution from car. You know, there is less international or local air travel. There is no waste on the streets. Industrial pollution is less. And all it took was a global pandemic shutdown. But is that what we want? Do we need a COVID? Yeah to stop us, to make us realize. That is why I said, is this an age of realization? To quote our director general, I've taken this quote from one of our editorials, right? Where will this change come from? Like, is this the change we want? Is this the way we want to clean our air or our water? Yeah, we did this. We got a sense of and smell of what clean air, clean rivers and exuberant nature uh, means. We must value it. We must remember this time as the way we want it to be, when our lungs can inhale and exhale without the stress of toxins. But how long will it last? Right? This she had written it in May. Yeah, or I think it was in April. Right? And today we have already seen economic economic activity is necessary. Right? We, there have been livelihood loss because of COVID, even worse than ever before. Right? So economic activity has to be there. But what we cherish, will we be able to deliver? Like I said earlier, the three uh, failures, this is a solution. We need the courage to think differently. We need to be the change we want in the world, which means we need to act differently. We need to be informed. We can only bring about change if we are informed, if we are engaged. Right? It, it is incumbent on all of us to be engaged and willing to stand up. Right? Each citizen of us and all of you are listening, we need to question why. We need to question the policy. We need to question our leaders. And more importantly, we need to question ourselves. Right? Why, what can we do to bring about the change? Right? So that brings me to the end of my presentation. Uh, I'm sorry, ma'am. <laughs> you know, I did say that we should, um, you know, I'll just take 20 minutes. We have overrun. It's already 11.40. Um, I will stop sharing the presentation. And if there's anything that you want to share, ma'am, uh, please let me know. Yeah. Very nice. And uh, information. Thank you. It's uh, very relevant. And uh, people are... People re require this information, I feel so, because af uh, after they have faced this COVID-19 situation, uh, I think most of them have realized to what ex in what extent they have to be within the uh, like environment. So before that, I just want to give, like one of the participants has asked uh, how to bring the awareness uh, within the students about water conservation. Uh, this was one question by a participant. And she needs to know how the students can be aware related to water conservation. Okay, so uh, thank you, um, um, a great question. Yes, we talk about them, right? Students can be the agents of change, right? Uh, but of course we also can be, each one of us can be a change agents, but how do we reach them? Now, um, you know, uh, there are many, many programs. It can happen in the classroom. It can happen in homes. Now, uh, I would like to draw attention uh, to what CSE does. We have a program called the Green Schools Program, right? As part of the program, we ask schools to get children to audit the consumption of resources in the school premises. Yeah. Now, it is great. We have a network of 10,000 schools across India. You can Google Green Schools Program .org, right? I'll just repeat it. And uh, uh, ma'am, if you can just put it on the screen, it's www.greenschoolsprogram.org. So, um, uh, so the GSP uh, has an audit where we ask children to measure, to assess the consumption of resources. They are supposed to feed the data. It's an online. They feed the information in various areas of water, waste, you know, how they commute to school. What is the consumption of energy? Does the school, uh, you know, have they moved to uh, like LED bulbs? Do they have solar in their school? Do they use biogas? 
you ask them a whole lot of questions they feed the information and then in the end they uh, you know uh, we csc or the green schools program give e school their report card the report card then becomes a baseline for the schools to develop strategies to improve their performance yeah so uh, so that's the way we reach schools but because of covid because of covid schools were shut right then we didn't want environment education to stop we wanted to find out how do we reach children so then we pivoted and we modified the gsp school audit into something called gsp audit at home we asked children to find out how do you you know how resource efficient is your home do you switch off lights do you switch off if your computer is it on standby mode if you have computers or if you have phone you know uh, do you keep charging it all night simple do you practice waste segregation at home do you have dustbins which are out for wet wet and waste do you have a shower bath or a bucket bath right does the tap keep running when you are um, you know uh, uh, when you um, when you brushing your teeth what is the indoor air pollution like right indoor air pollution also adds right it is it is as toxic as outdoor pollution so we ask children to do an home audit close to 50000 children participated in the month of july so if anyone is interested so we decided you know environment education has to continue whether at a home or in school so through children so we reached out to children and that was the kind of response we got so i want to say you know that is, i just talked about what our program is doing but really what i want to say is all of us are responsible right adults can you know children copy adults so we are responsible to show the right correct actions right we do capacity building of teachers we do workshops with teachers we are now doing online workshop for school teachers uh, you know we work with state partners like himachal pradesh uh, like sikkim like church of south india like um, you know a lot of schools around india we work with so we are doing capacity building workshop for teachers so they can integrate environment in their classroom teaching right so it is a gsp or a capacity building workshop we doing webinars like this in the hope that you know teachers have also joined and then tell them how bad the environment is but let's not lose hope we can do corrective action and it'll be great if all of you can take action yeah thank you sorry that was a long answer but i hope <laughs> you just summarize capacity building workshop every adult has a responsibility to do the right thing to influence their children and our gsp programs there are many programs for learning by doing children can uh, make a difference yeah thank you, thank you. Uh, thank you madam and uh, one more question by other participant uh, whether heavy rain is the reason for floods whatever it's occurring now that's what that that is the question from their side okay um you know uh yeah let me look back right i'm in my 50s now so when i look back at my school age right rainfall was there for many many months july to september we would have rainfall in delhi right but again it's not like uh, what uh, the it's not like a steady uh, rainfall like what happens in kerala or uh, karnataka or uh, you know bombay i've lived in bombay too it's very different delhi rains are very different yeah but flooding would not happen there were enough green spaces for water to percolate right we had there was not so much of waste gathering right and um, you know uh, uh, drains getting clogged yeah as over the last 30 years if you look at it i mean i want all of you to reflect right because if you look at your answers within you will realize where the change has happened in the last 20 years yeah it has worsened in the last four or five it's even it's even worse why look at it i mean our drains are clogged right uh, there is so much of cemented pathways right earlier there was no soil right there is there a forest um, a, you know a deforestation happening so the soil is being used there are multiple reasons on why extreme floods are happening 
Yeah, uh, we hear about uh, whether it's uh, you know uh, floods in uh, Bengal in you know in Bengal or whether it is localized floods. Just look around; you will identify the reason. There is noise. There are municipal bodies who will say they will clean the water drain, but it's always too late. And um, uh, uh, you know, waste management. You and I are responsible for right. That also adds to it. So look at it, and you will identify the reasons for flooding. Yeah. yeah. So uh, yes. I would like to put it on us more than anyone else. Okay. Uh, and uh, this is from my side. Uh, it's just I need some kind of uh, suggestion. It means, what do you think for this particular question? Uh, do you think the villages are under stress just because of uh, migration of workers from cities to villages? Uh, very good question, ma'am. It's related, it related to COVID also. We saw the mass migration happening. It's related to COVID 19. Uh, yeah, in the month of May and all. It was really horrifying to see how these people have been you know, impacted, right? And uh, and so many died on the way to go back, right? We, we let them down. Cities, yeah. we people let them down and they had no choice, right? They were the backbone of our lives. We let them down, they had to migrate. And of course, they are totally, totally stressed, but they also realize uh, there is now reverse migration happening. And yeah, people are coming back because there are no livelihoods there. Yeah. yeah, and I do, uh, you know, uh, it happened in my own household, right? My help and all went back to the village, but they came back saying that they don't have, there's nothing to live there for. So we have let, they let them down, whether it's cities or villages, because villages do not have the infrastructure either, right? Where are the hospitals? Where are the schools, right? So these people like to come back to cities, where at least the earnings are much more, they can send money back home. And at least, you know, children can go back. Come back to your question again, ma'am, because I think I've digressed. Uh, the yeah, that's what, yeah, the major thing is now, like when the people go back to their native places, uh, native places, uh, what they do, they are like in this, they were in the cities for many years because of their work or whatever it is. And when they go back to the villages, they will bring the lifestyle of the cities in the villages. And now villages are also under stress. That's the, the that's what I I was because uh, see now when I go to my native place also before I never used to see much plastic covers or uh, mm. the packaging materials all these things but now these materials are entering into villages now so uh, this is the thing like this is the one thing I'm thinking uh, yeah. because of the people uh, who were mm. living in the city now they are oh, in Okay. Um, you know, we haven't really, I haven't really looked at that point of view. But again, ma'am, I would like to say uh, it's consumerism, right? Yeah. Uh, I think uh, there is aspiration to, right? And uh, people in villages also want to live this lifestyle of what is happening in urban centers. Yeah. But I would say it is more the, um, you know, uh, 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 marketing, right? Yeah. Uh, we also decided that every product could reach, yeah, uh, the, you know, villages too. I, every uh, lifestyle should go. Like we enjoyed it. So why not let it go to the villages? And I let everyone, uh, you know, and we also aspire. They also want that stuff. So, uh, but you know, the education hasn't reached there. Yeah, like they haven't, I mean, we are realizing it now, but even amongst ourselves, how many of us know we would still go, you know, we would still go and buy, a, a, you know, a kurkure ka packet or a bujia ka packet, which is there in a kirana dukan, right? That adds a so much of packaging. The same packaging, because we want long shelf life, that has made it to the shops and villages, right? In prices that they can afford. So it's that which is adding more. And I don't think, so if you give these goods to people, they will use it. Of course, we can also say no to it, right? But I don't, uh, you know, but <laughs> it's a cash 22 situation, right? Uh, we are at fault too, but I will not blame the villagers because we uh, we, we people in, uh, in urban cities have already spoiled, right? We have accepted, we are buying goods. And I wouldn't say that people living in rural areas should not have access to what we already have. We can educate them and tell them not to buy. These are actually more polluting. You have your good resources, 
right? Rural areas, you have good practices, you have good food, you have you had access to clean water. So let's look into our own practices and then have a, you know, continue with your own lifestyle than aping what is there in urban areas. So I wouldn't uh, blame people who went back to their villages, right? They're aping what is what we are doing in urban areas. Yeah. Okay. So we have ten more minutes. So I can take another two, three questions. Yeah. Yeah. Like uh, um, Professor Mayer sir is there? Uh, he, yeah. He's from the British department. He is having some questions, and the questions are from the participants itself, man. Just a minute. Okay. Okay. Yes. But one of the yes, participants sir. wants to know. Is sanitizer uses contribute to air pollution? Are you doing some uh, some work research on that uh, usage of sanitization? Uh, we haven't really done research on sanitizers, but yes, uh, uh, you mean the hand sanitizers, right? That we're using during COVID time. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm afraid CSC hasn't done any uh, research on that, but I have read articles. Right. Uh, I would say more than sanitizers, it's it's washing, right? As what's prescribed by WHO, washing your hands with soap and water is the best way, right? Of course, in a water stressed country, even running the tap, uh, even running the tap uh, for twenty seconds does stress water resources. Yeah, but uh, you know sometimes we do have to make a compromise. So I personally, I don't use sanitizers. I mean, I do carry a bottle, but wherever I get a chance, I would rather use soap and water to wash my hands. Yeah, but uh, but no, we haven't done any research on that, so I wouldn't be able to answer from CSC's point of view. Madam, another question from that uh, participants. So uh -huh. environmental degradation has become a global problem. How the international community addressed this uh, issue through major international agreements? So uh, we have, I mean, you know, there's, uh, you know, there are these COPs, conference of parties happen that every year, not this year though. There is a lot of debate, discussion going on. So there is, there has been the Paris Agreement, where every country had to commit to so much reduction, 1.5 to 2 degrees centigrade reduction in it, you know, uh, that so that can bring the global warming down. So there is a whole lot, so many countries, 100, close to 200 countries are committed to it. So at a global level, Yes, there is dialogue, there is talks that is happening. It has now, it has now to come down uh, to country level and at the local level. So, right, there's no point in saying this country is not reaching its emissions. U.S. is, uh, uh, you know, um, is one of the biggest polluters. Uh, you know, China is, India is. No, let us not look outside. Let us start with you and me. Of course, I'm not saying, it's not saying that, you know, policy makers or the governments are not responsible. They should be held accountable. They are responsible. But, um, you know, the dialogues are happening. They are giving strategic direction. But at the country level and local level, it's up to us to follow. Yeah, so uh, there's plenty of information available on climate change, the dialogues that are happening in Rio, the Paris Agreement, at the global level, sir. But from, uh, my one question. Everyone is talking about uh, a boon COVID-19. Is boon on environment or pain on environment? Uh, yeah, it's a, very, uh, it's a very philosophical question, actually. I mean, uh, you know, I mean, of course, we can look at the science of it and then uh, say, but I will take it to a different, uh, you know, yeah, I would rather uh, look at it, right? Uh, look at the, um, it has upended the world. Right, we do not know, we still are unclear as to where we are headed, though we are now becoming used to it. Right, we are becoming careless, yeah. Human, you know, now, uh, you know, we are getting out on the roads. The scare that was there at the beginning of March and April and even May that is kind of abated, right? Um, you know, so at least I feel that COVID has taught us a lesson. Right, and but whether the less whether we will learn anything from here in other six months, I don't know. I hope we don't lose. So, in a way, if uh, short term, it is a pain, right? It definitely is. It has brought the world to a standstill. It has completely, uh, you know, um, uh, it has completely stopped us. We have stopped in our tracks. Everything has halted. 
So yes, but if we learn lessons, if we learn lessons from it, how to manage our environment, how to manage our resources, then I would consider the boom. But right now, I'm not, you know, uh, we are, have all been impacted. So right now, at the short term, I see it as a boom. But I hope as we progress and as we learn lessons, it will be seen as, yes, you know, I'm glad that happened. Yeah, but uh, right now, it's, uh, I'm not in a, uh, um, I see it as a main. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah, uh, there is uh, one more question from the participant, madam. Uh -huh. uh, you, can you tell a, a short form uh, to learn about environment? In a, in a short, they need the information. Uh, sorry, the lesson of environment in a short form, they're asking. Uh, in a single sentence, can you say in what way they should be to know about the environment or to be within the environment? You know, uh, Down to Earth is one of our publication, right? You asked me in one sentence, but one of the taglines in an earlier thing was subscribe to common sense, right? That is one of the biggest lessons. I mean, I'm simplifying it, but subscribe to common sense. That is what it is, right? And if we use a common sense, if we are considerate, right, we can save the environment. Right? Of course, there's policy making. There are a lot of other issues. I'm not, since you asked me in one sentence, uh, look back to what your grandparents did. Look at their practices. They were more, more sensitive to the environment. Right? Much more than us. Right? We, if you look, I mean, you know, ask your grandparents. They, they would have, uh, I, I know it's, you said, uh, you know, I'll take one minute. Right? We did not waste water. Every household then had a well. Yeah. Right. We had rainwater harvesting systems in our house, in our home homes. Right. We would have uh, in a compost pit dug somewhere in the compound of our homes. Where are all those practices gone? So look back. Right. Subscribe to your common sense. Look back at the practices that existed in our own families, and you will be much more sensitive to the aware to the environment. Awareness will be there. And then you can be there. There are a lot of information available. You can go to Center for Science, a CSE's website, on research that we have done, the reports that we have brought about. There's a wealth of information. But practice, right, is very important. And that itself, uh, I think, will help you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I, you know, one sentence, subscribe to common sense is what I would say. Yeah. Yeah, I think with this, uh, we can end the session. And it was very interesting. I'll be sharing your email ID, madam, if you don't mind, to the participants, so sure. that if they have any queries, they can directly contact you and uh, they can come to know about the research, whatever it's going on. Anyway, they can get a lot of information if they go to the CSC website, because even yeah. I came about that like that only. So oh, that's the same. And uh, it was very informative. And I think all participants uh, uh, got the information related to environment issues that especially in this uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, 2020 situation. Yeah. Thank you. One minute, minute, sorry, I just want to add here. Yeah, please feel free to write to me. But when you send me an email, please write, uh, you know, coherently with full sentences and to the point. Right? That's what I would like. So that's a request. But second thing, somebody, your first question was also how to teach children about water. Uh, yes. conservation exactly exactly so that is what just one minute to go so i'll just cover that also um sure. you know ma'am uh, whoever asked a question it's a great question we do ask children right to maintain a water diary right many schools do that as to how many liters of water do they consume in various water activities the water audit we also have a water audit for schools where we ask children does your school have a rainwater harvesting system? If they say yes, then you ask them what type of rainwater harvesting system is it? Is it groundwater recharge or is it a storage tank? Because we want to go further. We are not looking at yes and no answers. So uh, yes, you can ask water diaries to be maintained. If it's rainwater harvesting, take them. Okay, right now it's difficult. Let them do, let them search if there are rainwater harvesting structures in the area. 
from say 10 years, 15 years ago. There is a lot of wisdom. So that's how you can create more awareness amongst your children. Sorry, I missed that question. I thought I didn't answer it and I thought I'd take this opportunity back. So uh, thank you. You've already thanked me. It was a great interaction. Uh, thank you so much for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for giving me this opportunity also for us, each and every participant that we reached out to and sensitized into the environment is a very big uh, thing for us. So thank you so much. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Man. Thank you. Man. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.